now tuned in to the Dervish Commercial Real Estate Podcast. This is an opportunity that you have at one of your centers. Right. It's excess land right. that's being underutilized and you're looking to we add value. To in your opinion, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, it's kind of like when you look at it, you know. Hi, welcome to our commercial real estate podcast. This is Jeff Dervich with Dervich Real Estate here. I appreciate you listening in with us. Today we have a great show. We will be discussing the legal world of commercial real estate, including topics and tips surrounding retail shopping center ownership. We're going to be discussing the evolution of the retail lease, as well as the intricacies involved in a shopping center transaction and methods on how to best handle certain protocols involved in a landlord-tenant relationship. Our guest today is Larry Silvestri with Silvestri Law. Larry is a longtime industry veteran and has been in the commercial real estate business for over 33 years. He has held positions as Assistant General Counsel for Highland Superstores, which was at one point the second largest American electronics retailer behind Circuit City. He was General Counsel and Vice President of the Zaramba Group, a developer out of Ohio, where he focused on ground-up development projects and the management of their shopping center portfolio. He later joined the Goodman Companies out of West Palm Beach as general counsel. The Goodman Company is one of the most respected and knowledgeable private shopping center developers in the eastern part of the United States. Larry currently resides in St. Petersburg, Florida, and is managing shareholder of Sylvester Law PA. Larry, thank you for being here with us. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Absolutely, it's our pleasure. Larry, if you will, can you talk about the process of a shopping center transaction from a buyer's point of view? Process, timeline, items to be cognizant of, etc. cetera. Sure, um, let's take it from the conceptual level. Um, I'm an attorney, I've got a new client who wants to get into an acquisition of a shopping center. Sure. My advice to that client is first, formulate your strategy. Why is it that you want to make this investment? What do you expect out of this investment? Um, Are you acquiring a core stabilized institutional quality shopping center Mm -hmm. for the cash flow that's in place and uh, paying the appropriate amount based on that? Or are you looking for something that's uh, got some stabilized income but has a value added opportunity? Say, for example, there's some vacant space, there's space that needs to, uh, should be retenanted with upgraded tenants, uh, there's maybe room for an out parcel or room for expansion. Um, or are you looking for a project to reposition for the value add? Say it's one of these uh, 1960s or 1970s era shopping centers in the Tampa Bay area say it's uh, St. Pete or Pinellas County, and uh, used to be Grocery Anchor Shopping Center, but now that's vacant and it's otherwise dying. Mm -hmm. Great opportunity. You're not buying for the income in place, you're buying for that repositioning. Um, Or is it a distressed center? Um, Of course, what I just mentioned with a vacant Anchor space would be distressed, but mm-hmm. there are other types of distress with shopping centers. It could be that on the surface, driving by the shopping center, it looks fine. Uh, but what you don't know is that the owner is upside down because of their capital structure. Distress. Right? And it's distressed just on the capital side. So those are all potential investment targets. Mm-hmm. So I'd say to my client, you know, what is it that you're looking for? What is it that you think you bring to the table? How should we formulate your strategy? And of course, goals and intentions and things of that nature. Right. Uh, what do you plan to put into it in terms of effort, capital, and everything else? Those are all parts of it. So uh, what size of project? Of course, that's pretty critical. You know, yeah. what is your investment range? Are we talking about... Uh, something uh, under $2 million, a very small strip center, we're we talking about something larger, 100,000 square feet, or even larger. What are your capital sources and projected uses? 
What does it look like to you? How much leverage are you going to have? Uh, are you putting in all the equity required? Or are you bringing in an equity partner or um, a straight up joint venture partner with someone who maybe has management capabilities that you don't have? All of those things that you, you need to think about initially. Um, but one of the most important things is, is what is your necessary and desired returns? What is your minimum return that would get you interested in the deal? What are your aspirational returns? Um, Jeff, you know, performers are, are very important in analyzing any kind of income producing property. Um, and I, usually involve a lot of assumptions as well that you have to make prior to. It's all in the assumptions. And um, for that reason, there's never one project pro forma, a project pro forma. Um, you always have the pro forma that is the one you do with dark glasses on, your worst case scenario, the one where the assumptions are bleak. So it's not just like a back of a napkin type of thing? You start there. Okay. But I would never end there. <laughs> I, I, I would not recommend making a purchase based on that. I recommend gauging your interest based on that. Sure. Um, but you need at least three napkins. <laughs> <laughs> three napkins, I like that. You need the worst case, you need the optimistic case, and you need the one in the middle. Gotcha. And, and really, in organizations that I've been in, you can run 30 or 40 pro formas for a ground up development because you don't even have the tenants in place. So you have to make all kinds of assumptions like, okay, I'm gonna have X square feet of apparel. I'm gonna get you know, the, the service people and they're gonna pay X per square foot. So to build that pro forma. It's a blank it, canvas. It's a blank canvas. Essentially. When you're buying an existing center, it's, it's, you know, you've got what's in place, who's gonna stay, who is my target to replace. Um, it's more of a sure thing as well, on the front it, end of the deal at least. It is, you, you know, you've got income in place. Um, so a client comes to you and they say, you know, Larry, we're looking at buying this thing. At what point do you like to be involved? Do you like to be, hey, listen, we're ready to go. Let's draft up this purchase and sale agreement and move forward. Or do you, do you like to huddle up with them, formulate a team? You, you be yourself on the legal counsel, have engineers involved, construction people to really make sure that you're underwriting all the correct assumptions. Early as possible. You take what comes to you, but you know I would prefer to be in early to try to help guide the person in their thinking, or more importantly, if they already have a plan, I need to understand the plan. Uh, but I can fit anywhere in the process. Sure. It's, it's a good thing uh, to be in before the deal is struck, so you can ask some of the questions that the business people might not think of. It's a team effort. Sure. And uh, you know, you mentioned the construction and you know your due diligence. One of the things that is, uh, well, we talk about pro formas, financial modeling. Who's going to do the financial modeling? Is it uh, the individual who is the investor? Is it someone he has on his team already? Um, is it the broker? because brokers can you know, help you set forth models or whatever, um, or do you outsource that? Um, I've had, in most of the circumstances where I was in-house counsel, we had a team of financial people. Chief, Analysts. Chief financial officer, analyst, you know, and then we had the um, leasing people who would feed them assumption. We would have a construction department that would feed them the assumptions on the construction. Um, but that's not you know, always the case, particularly when you have somebody who has a, a, a small team or just starting out putting their team together. Mm -hmm. um, and I recommend outsourcing the financial modeling. Um, even if you do your own back of the napkin, when- To get another person's You get to the point where you you're actually, it. yeah. Particularly if it's a, a existing shopping center with leases in place. Somebody needs to really underwrite those leases because leases are assets. 
They're living, breathing living organisms. Living and breathing. Uh, a bad lease is a liability, but typically the, the lease is the asset. That's how we look at things. We look at the cash flow. We capitalize that cash flow. The leases are everything. That's what you're buying. When you buy an existing shopping center, you're buying the leases that are in place. You're buying the existing cash flow, and you have to make sure that's underwritten properly. You have to make sure that everything is accounted for as it relates to rent and all expenses. Uh, and that it's being conveyed properly over to the the rent rolls in order to be able to include into the your Argus models to make your assumptions for future cash flow, uh, doing your ten year um, ten year look and things of that nature. Absolutely, and and uh, you know there's there's some things there that are black and white, and there are things that are judgment. So at least for the black and white stuff, um, say you're buying a, a shopping center that has. 10 existing tenants. Um, say that you're planning to expand the shopping center. There's a way to expand it to add a new anchor. Mm -hmm. um, let's say that anchor is a significant anchor, you know, like a Publix, which will completely change the character of this shopping center, which is currently anchored by an off-price closing clothing retailer like uh, Ross, TJ Maxx, or whatever. Sure. So I'm going to bring in a, a grocery store, a dominant grocery store. It's going to change your leasing, your leasing possibilities mm -hmm. for, for any spaces that are vacant and for the ones that will turn over. Uh, you, you may want to, you know, even even get rid of some of the tenants that would be okay in, under the current configuration, but they won't be able to pay the rent necessary when you get the new traffic, and they could be replaced by, by better tenants. So when you're racing to analyze a property, because it's usually a race, if it's a decent opportunity, there are other people chasing it. Sure. <laughs> so like timeline and whatnot, timeline. or something like that. Um, you know, you're, you're looking at the property, you want to get deep, deeply into it. It's interesting to you, and you think that there's a, a place to go there. Um, there are people who you can outsource the lease uh, abstracting to, um, there's two levels of lease abstracting in my experience. There's the financial lease abstracting, and that's what I'm talking about. And then there's the legal lease abstracting, and they need to kind of work together um, because the legal perspective is, is different. I'll, I'll continue my example. We're going to add a new tenant, a new major tenant to a shopping center. Well, you need to review those leases to see what your rights are. You need to see, um, did the landlord when they entered into these leases, reserve the right to expand the shopping center, to relocate tenants, to fiddle with the common areas. Um, so that's a initial important legal type review. I recently, you know, in this example I'm giving you, there actually is a real life um, project that I've worked on. Uh, and uh, my initial role in that was to take those leases and not really abstract them, not really worry about the financial aspect because those were already like in the initial rent rolls, mm -hmm. but to see if there are any obstacles to the plan redevelopment. See if it had the flexibility to do what your client's intentions were. Exactly. So I, I you know, dove in and with that in mind, I looked at the leases, I, I looked at them to see if there was any red flags, uh, just in general, you know, like, uh, termination options or, you know, crazy things like that, 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 that might affect how you'd financially underwrite it that might not otherwise have popped up yet because you're just looking at a rent roll. Then it's right to the provisions that say what rights the landlord has retained. Um, and in this case, we got past that threshold. There were no tenants that would be able to stop the landlord from doing what the landlord wanted to do. They could complain, <laughs> but if, if push came to shove, uh, we were pretty confident that the landlord had the legal right to do the reconfiguration. So then the financial um, abstracting is done by an outside party. I don't know if you've heard gotcha. of CRE models. CRE, yes. Um, I've had good experience with them. Uh, Michael Harris and St. Pete runs that project. Uh, when I was with the Goodman Company, for most of the time I was there, we had in-house financial people. Sure. But there came a time when we downsized. And after we downsized, that's how I was introduced to CRE models. 
Uh, we use them in connection with some uh, asset repositioning, some sales and some purchases. And I found that to be a good alternative to having in-house people. So I would counsel someone to think about the efficiency of that piece, sending that piece out. Mm -hmm. And regardless if you do it in-house or if, if you do do it in-house, you always want someone to double check your work, right? Like if you, if you put together a financial model, it's always good and can never hurt to have another set of eyes put, put on that. And, and when it, when, as it relates to lease abstracting and making assumptions, it's very subjective and it's important that you, you know, it's th everything's kind of thoroughly thought of because this is what you're basing your, your go or no go decision off of. Now, as, as it relates to the leases, I'm sure you've been involved, you know, at the Goodman companies and the Zaramba group participating and putting leases together in the, in the 90s and in the 80s and whatnot. And, and today's day and age, as it relates to a lot of the big boxes, grocers uh, and a lot of big box retailers evolving or morphing over time, their business plans and how, how they've changed uh, how they operate, uh, some going into bankruptcy, some consolidating stores, um, store closures and things of that nature. How have you seen the actual lease change over time? Um, you know, you have, uh, you know, shopping centers continue to evolve in, in response to changing consumer preferences and habits, and so have the leases as well. You know, things such as co-tenancy restrictions, um, shorter-term leases. I mean, we were out in uh, ICSC uh, Las Vegas uh, at the end of May, and we attended a panel discussion uh, where Warby, Warby Parker, the, uh, the eyeglass retailer, was there, and they were discussing their plans for moving forward with uh, store growth. And they made it very, very apparent that in their leases, they're doing very short-term leases. They're going to come into a market. They're going to a place that they want to be, that they have all this market research that they want to, because they're primarily online, that they want to go and open up a shop. But they're not signing a 10, 15, 20-year lease. They're doing three, five-year leases more or less. And they want to go test the waters and see how that is. And, and just, just talk about what your experience has been with how the evolution of the lease has changed. Sure. Um you give a, a very good example of what we're seeing now, uh, which we didn't see so much in the past. In, in doing the ground-up development th that I did for the, what we would call the bell cow tenants, you know, the tenants that you make a deal with because you want them in your center because you can lease off of those tenants. Sure. Whether it's the anchor or, or the junior acres or the specialty shops. There are certain tenants, like Star the, the Starbucks. Lead, right. Starbucks is a little small tenant, take a small footprint, but you want them if you can get them mm -hmm. because there are other tenants that will say, oh, well, if Starbucks has underwritten this location, we'll go there. And they're a driver <laughs> as well. You know, they bring, they bring foot, traffic foot traffic to the center. Mm -hmm. They're a good brand to have as co-tenancy, as, as a co-tenant in, in a shopping center. So I understand your point. So we would normally want a good initial term from a tenant like that. Um, you know, we typically would get a 10-year lease. That was pretty much the same through the 90s and the 2000s. And, uh, but after the Great Recession, not just the Warby Parkers, but a lot of tenants have been shortening their initial terms and, you know, g controlling the property for themselves with options, which um, doesn't really help the landlord in its underwriting, but you have to make the deal that's there to be made. Um, I've seen a lot of um, shifts over time in how the tenants focus on the lease itself, the different terms, um, the co-tenancies. Co-tenancies took a big shift in the 2000s. Um, and it's, for landlords, it's a major minefield. Um, when you're doing a ground-up development, there's initial co-tenancies and there's ongoing co-tenancies. Back in the... What is a co-tenancy, if you could explain? Absolutely. Uh, when a tenant is coming into a shopping center, they want to know that they're going to be surrounded by a critical mass of other tenants. Um, you go back to the regional mall concept. The regional mall was put together because a department store agreed to go there and that's how you would get the other specialty retailers and in the early days and from most of the cycle of regional mall development the department stores were subsidized they would get free dirt or they would get uh, low rent and they wouldn't always pay their account the 
pro rata share of common area and everything else, that would all get picked up by the inline tenants. Well, well, for that reason, the inline tenants wanted to know that a certain number of the department stores would remain in operation, and so that was the original co-tenancy type evolution. As a small tenant, I would say, well, if uh, there are two department stores, if, if one of them goes dark, maybe I'll have a certain remedy, and if they both go dark, I need to be able to terminate. Sure. It evolves from there. With a typical department store anchor shopping center, like a Kohl's anchor shopping center, or a BJ's Wholesale Club anchor shopping center, you get the same issues from tenants. It's not quite the same because it's not as dependent on the anchor department store as a regional mall is because you're still going to get traffic, but they still care about whether or not there's an anchor. So uh, tenants with the negotiating power will say uh, if the anchor tenant goes away or if the occupancy level of the non-anchor tenants goes below a certain point, then I want remedies. And those remedies typically start out as a period of reduced rent and then the right to terminate. And uh, what the landlord wants is the right to either terminate or go back to full rent so they can't stay on reduced rent for a long time. There's a lot of permutations to that, but uh, they used to be fairly simple to negotiate because it was this anchor tenant or a comparable replacement. And sure. The, and the comparable replacement language was pretty broad, so you didn't have to have, you know, uh, if you wanted to replace Kohl's, it didn't have to be Target. <laughs> right. It could be someone else. It might not even be a full-line department store. It might be somebody that's occupying 80% of the space. Um, and then you would have... Uh, maybe for the other inline space, a 50% requirement or a 70% requirement, depending on the strength of the tenant that's negotiating the co-tenancy. Well, in the 2000s, it um, started getting tougher. By the mid-2000s, the retailers uh, that I was working with were saying they were naming or coming pretty close to naming who would be a comparable replacement tenant and they were being pretty specific about which tenants had to be there as co-tenants. So if you had, uh, depending on the size of the project, eight or ten national tenants, they would say at least five or six of those named tenants have to still be there. Sure. So now, as a landlord... But now there are, some of those are out of business yeah, you're, nowadays. Yeah, are a replacement. You know, so you got to... Repl- we did. A, I did a lot of Borders bookstores in my day. So you have a Borders bookstore, and you know you have to replace it with a comparable bookstore. Yeah, and the, and that those just don't. This the evolution of that in that particular retailer has just has changed um, the concept. You know, we're we're seeing a lot of when landlords and retailers are sitting down at the table now, they need to be talking about the exit strategy. How does the breakup look? Before it was, okay, let's get the deal done and we'll just extend it out for forever. You know what I mean? You look at the Kmart stuff. Optimistic. You know, and, and so now it needs to be like, all right, this is going to end at some point in time. And what does that look like? You want to make sure on the landlord side, on the, on the, re, on the tenant side, you want to make sure that you have the ability to sublease the space. If, you're, if, you're, um, if your growth or your uh, evolution of how you are being emergent changes, um, and then on the on the landlord side, uh, if they do go out, you want them you want to you want to have some flexibility to be able to potentially relocate them, or if their business model changes and they have the, the desire to take less space, landlords and and tenants need to come to the table at the beginning of the negotiation and understand what the exit strategy looks like. Absolutely, and and because we go through cycles, we sometimes have short memories about those cycles, uh, but. Pretty much everybody remembers what happened with the Great Recession and the downsizing of everything. And, and so uh, clearly it's on the tenants' minds. Uh, that's why they have shorter terms coming in up front. They don't want to make as long of a commitment. Um, tenants are very concerned about their ability to retenant the space or to get out from under it. And landlords are very concerned about their control of the space because the shopping center isn't just a bunch of different stores. It's a merchandise mix. 
<laughs> and it's very important for the landlord to keep some control over that merchandise mix for the vacant space that comes up along the way that the landlord has to fill. Absolutely. So if the tenant has a free reign to re-tenant with whatever uh, for their economic benefit, the landlord has a competing interest. Oh, of course, so, yeah. So there's always friction, and I think you're right that the parties are more concerned about it up front now than they ever used to be. Sure. And, you know, the, <laughs> the negotiating power always dictates. There's always the macro and the micro that is involved in how these specific lease terms come out. So, for example, there are times when it's a buyer's slash tenant's market where landlords need tenants because there's a dearth of tenants. There aren't a lot of new concepts coming out. There are more stores closing than opening, which is where we find ourselves now. Sure. Uh, and then there's a time when it's a, uh, a seller's or landlord's market, which is where I was in in the 90s and the early 2000s, where there were a lot of retailers that were expanding. Everybody wanted to get into locations. Power centers were easy to put together. Um, you know, we were doing 400,000, 500,000 square foot shopping centers because there were enough different boxes. There was more than one office supply store. There was more than one bookstore. There was more than one off-price apparel retailer expanding. Sure. Um, you know, so you get the example I gave you was Kohl's. So you get a Kohl's to commit, and then you start building off of that. And there are, gee, more than one consumer electronics guy to go to. So you could put those deals together as the landlord. The tenants always have negotiating power because the lease is the asset, and we have nothing without them, which is why um, the leasing guys have such value to any 100%. organization. Absolutely. The leasing guys with the, with the relationships where the retailers will answer their calls, will look at their you know, projected, or their projects that they're working on and, and give it a fair um, review. Um, so the tenants always have some negotiating power, but it does shift a little. You can, you can be a little more um, strident as a landlord when you have maybe two or three options to fill that type of box. But it's always about merchandise mix. The landlord doesn't want to give up control of that completely. Because um, that, that's, that's how you build the sustainability of the shopping center or strip center for the long term. And in right. this e-commerce environment, you have to make sure that you have a proper tenant mix in order for your center to be the most competitive and sustainable um, for the long term so that everyone in the center can generate higher sales. I mean, that's the end goal. You want everyone in your center to have the highest sales possible and incorporating the proper tenant mix allows you to, to do such. Um, let me ask you, Larry, if in today's day and age, you're having so many of these retailers declaring bankruptcy, um, you know, or, or, you know, and they're still on a lease or they're going dark and things mm -hmm. of that nature. If you're a shopping center owner with one of these big box stores that are filing bankruptcy, such as a Southeastern grocer or uh, companies of that nature, you know, what are, what are your rights as a landlord? I mean, you have a lease with them, right? But they're going through bankruptcy bankruptcy, and like, and typically, you know, if you could shed, shed some light on what that process typically is like. Um, there can be a typical progression, but each case can be different. Uh, you know, <laughs> so it's not always the it's same? It's not always the same. Um, you, you give a good example, Southeastern Grocers. Um, their bankruptcy is a reorganization. In a reorganization, what they're looking at is keeping the winners and getting rid of the losers. Okay. So as a landlord, it's, it's important to know whether you're on the list of winners or losers. And you don't know <laughs> initially. You have an idea if you're getting sales reports, if you, if you know where your location sits with everything else, but you, you really don't know how close to the bone they're going to cut as they're cutting stores. So the retailer goes into bankruptcy. The retailer has to come up with a plan. Uh, the landlord initially has to sit and wait for that plan. Um, there, there are, in the bankruptcy code, there are time periods when the tenant has to assume or reject. Um, but there are often extensions for that. And even when the tenant gets to the point where 
they can no longer legally extend, they can come to the landlord and say, we're still trying to decide. Do you want to give us more time? Um, or you know, do you want to just know our answer? Sure. <laughs> and that depends a lot on the landlord situation. Do you want to recapture the space? Or you know, are you willing to stay and be with a, a restructured tenant that maybe is a stronger tenant now and is actually positioned to put capital improvements into their store in your shopping center? So you, you have the legal aspect, which is statutory and going into court. And, uh, if it, you, is the recapture space, is that typically the tenant saying, hey, here's the keys back, you know, let's just go our separate ways or? Yes, but if the tenant rejects in bankruptcy, you're entitled to damages and your damages are, are generally limited to, let's say about a year and a half worth of rent. Okay. There are exceptions to that, but you know, you're, you're not going to accelerate rent. You're not going to get them to stay on the hook, but so if they you have do ten, get damages. Ten, 10 years lease, 10 years left on the lease in the term and yep. you're, and they come to you and, and they're filing for, for, is it chapter, chapter 11? Chapter bank? 11 is the reorganization, not, re- not the liquidation. Okay. So that's, you can have either one. If it's, if it's a liquidation, then they're going to terminate. Sure. Oh, actually, I shouldn't say that because leases are assets and it's an asset of the bankruptcy estate. So you will see, um, because it's an interest in real estate, they can sell it. And this gets tricky for the landlord because the landlord loses some control. Um, Lease provisions can prevail, like assignment and use restrictions and things of that nature, but you can find that you've got um, an electronics retailer who goes into bankruptcy Mm -hmm. and um, instead of rejecting the lease, they assume and assign it to another party. Um, probably the better example right now is Toys R Us. Sure. Which is exactly what's happening with Toys R Us. Toys R Us has some great real estate. They have below market rental rates on good properties. Um, with options. They also own properties, but forget those. We're talking about leases. With long term options at um, usually bumps, rent bumps, as opposed to you know, market rate type things because they're strong enough to do that. Um, so the landlord's sitting there, you know, now you, you've got, you had maybe a 20 year, 10 or 20 year initial term with another 30 years of options and the options go up, you know, 50 cents square foot a year or something to that, of that nature. It's an asset. So that's why you see in the trade information, uh, 10 more or 20 more Toys R Us stores have been bought by, um, could be a grocery store, where the grocery tra- store chains are buying them. We're seeing a few different people buying them. Um, but that, again, is where the landlord can lose control and you sometimes have to go into the bankruptcy court to get adequate protection. And that's another thing that the law provides. If the tenant is going to assume and assign the lease, or even if they're going to assume the lease and continue to operate, like in, in the Winn-Dixie Southeast Grocers circumstance, uh, because they're going through the bankruptcy and they want to assume the lease, the landlord can go in and say, I, I need adequate assurance, that's the term of art, that's the legal term, of future performance. And that, as a general matter, means curing any defaults, if there are any, and also um, getting satisfaction that they'll be able to perform in the future. That can be added guarantees sometimes that you don't have. Um, it, it, it varies and it costs a lot of money as a landlord to go into those big bankruptcies and, and try to get what you need, but sometimes it's worth it. You know, it's, it sounds like there's never any guarantees. When you buy these shopping centers that are secured by these national retailers, um, you know, who would have thought Winn Dixie would have ever gone out of business 20 years ago? I mean, I don't know their financial state 20 years ago, but when a lot of these owners purchased these assets with them as tenants, they had no indication what their future was going to look like. And you look at a Walmart of the world, and they're this big, powerful, you know, awesome retailer. You look at a lot of these other big box centers, you're buying the lease of the big box, essentially, it has the most amount of value. 
there's never any guarantees. And it's just, it's interesting, you know, it's interesting to kind of conceptually think about that. I mean, you're buying them based off of their credit rating, right? It's a credit tenant, you know, and once it's a credit tenant, that really is the factor in the purchase price or the value that you're allocating to that particular tenant in the mix that you have. And there are no guarantees. I've been around long enough to see, you know, surprises in terms of, uh, you know, tenants that, that appear solid and then they just fail. I mean, who would have thought you, you worked uh, for um, the company that was major competitor against Circuit City? Who would have thought Circuit City would have gone out of business 30, 40 years ago? Who would have thought Toys R Us would have gone out of business today? Who would have thought Winn Dixie would have gone out of business? You know, it's actually more to the point. Who would have thought Circuit City would have gone out of business five years before they did? Wow. Or Borders? Borders almost had a plan to survive, but it didn't come together. So really until just before it became apparent that they were gonna liquidate, people thought they would still continue to survive. So it can turn not exactly on a dime, but there are no guarantees. The Toys R Us thing is something that, that you know people saw the, the burden of the private equity and we see that operating in a lot of the bankruptcies. Now, um, the uh, burden of private equity prevents them from being nimble and doing the kinds of things they, they could possibly do to be competitive, and then all of a sudden it's a downward spiral. Um, you know, there are still people who, who are trying to save Toys R Us in America and to keep some of the stores open. Their Canada operations are continuing, and you know, I just know what I read, there are still people who are, are trying to see if they can keep some critical mass of Toys R Us stores. I hear, you know, it's retailers are evolving, as we know. You know, they used to want to take 80,000 square feet. Now they're operating out of 35,000 square feet. So just their business models are changing and, and e commerce is is here obviously and, and but retail's not dead is the is the good thing. I mean every all these retailers still want to have physical stores and have a physical presence. You know, seventy seventy eight percent of millennials say they, they they would prefer to to purchase an experience over things. You know what I mean? So these retailers that can can evolve and change and, and create experiences in conjunction with other retailers in districts and, and, and malls and shopping destinations are gonna be the ones to, to thrive in the future. And the centers that house these retailers are gonna be the ones that thrive into the future. Um, let's bring it down to a little bit of a smaller scale. As a strip center owner, you have mom and pop tenants that come to you and, and things of that nature. And they're, they're not the national Toys R Uses or the big boxes, you know, the small strip center with you know, five to 10 tenants and whatnot. Um, couple couple things I wanna just discuss with you. What, what's your opinions on, on options in a lease, right? When you have, you know, a, a, a tenant that comes to you and, you know, they're, they're a small operator, a couple locations, and, and they, they want, they said they'll do a five-year term and then they want f two five-year options. I mean, what, as a landlord, what is the benefit to give them options? Is there any benefit? No. The only benefit is to make the deal. And um, typically, uh, in the organizations I've been in, we wouldn't make that deal. We would, if they had a five-year initial term, the most we would give them as an option is another five years. And, um, and you do it to make the deal. And you, you try to make it, um, it gets complicated if you say that that option is going to be at a market rate. Sure, because that's subjective, right? But, but we have language. I'm the lawyer. I'm the word guy. I've got the language to say how we're going to determine that. We can do it by baseball arbitration. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I, have, I just did that on a particular lease where at the, at before like six months or a year before the renewal, the option is exercised. The landlord says, okay, here's what I say the market rate is going to be. The tenant can take it or object. If the tenant objects, then the tenant throws back what they think it is, and then you ultimately go to an arbitrator who ends up picking one or the other. So it's incentive for the landlord and the tenant to be close to what the real market is because So you're essentially one... negotiating a new deal anyways, right? Yes, you are. But it, it gives the tenant some control, and it gives the landlord some flexibility. 
Um, but typically in retail leases, the option term rent is negotiated up front sure. as a certain bump. And so the risk of that is always on the landlord because the tenant can always walk away. What, what can you do to best protect yourself and to, to vet out, you know, smaller retailers, mom and pop, you know, and strip centers and whatnot um, to ensure that they have the track record and credit to perform as a leasee? It's strictly a due diligence issue. Get as much financial information as you can from them. Um, is it someone who's already been operating? Then you can see operating statements as well as personal financials. Uh, you or your representative can visit their operation to get an idea of how well they're operating and, and what their trajectory is. But you really, there, there are no guarantees because um, when push comes to shove, cash is king and the small moms and pops typically don't have the wherewithal, whether their own deep pockets or the financing options, to rough it out through the tough times. So you're, you're, and sometimes you're taking a flyer on them, which means I've got the vacant space, they've got something that fits, maybe it's a good fit, yeah, maybe it's marginal, but um, what you don't want to do as a landlord is invest a lot in that tenant. So you want to give them space as is. Sure. Or vanilla box if it's, you know, a new space and let them worry about financing any improvements that they need. So that at least minimizes your downside and uh, you know hopefully it's a tenant that doesn't do a lot of, uh, of upfit that burdens your space things that will cost money to later reconfigure to get it back to a vanilla box or back to what uh, your next tenant wants to be so those are some of the things that you can do it's but it's really you know due diligence and minimizing your exposure to the loss what should you do if it's if a tenant stops paying rent? You know, what what are your rights, you know, as as being a landlord? Well, the first issue maybe is looking at the lease to, to see what your remedies are in default. But the primary issue is a business one. So I always say make contact with the tenant. You may want to send a default letter immediately, but follow up to determine if the problem is transient or permanent. What's caused the tenant to fail to pay rent? Uh, evictions and vacancies can be costly to landlords. Uh, so you have to assess the situation. Do you want the space back? And if you don't want the space back, what can you do to maybe help this tenant survive? Is it something that can survive? Uh, I've negotiated many temporary rent reductions or rent deferrals to give the tenant a chance to survive. For example, when I did regional malls, it was, wasn't uncommon to temporarily put a tenant on a percentage rent deal. Um, we always have rules of thumb as to what percentage of a tenant's gross income can be allocated to rent and be healthy. And a lot of times those ratios get out of whack. So uh, as a landlord, part of your business is to help them with their business. So we would do a temporary deal so that they would only pay a percentage of their sales and that percentage would usually relate to the, the higher end of what should be allocated to rent in their circumstance. And you, and you do this when somebody has a turnaround plan, when they have uh, convinced you at least that they're committed and that they have some ideas and some resources so they can turn it around. Uh, sometimes the uh, percentage rent deal requires them to pay back the deferred rent that's being lost. Sometimes it, it doesn't. A lot of times it doesn't because even when they get back on track, that, that added burden of trying to catch up doesn't work. But it can be mutually beneficial to keep the tenant in the space because as a landlord, we get hurt by vacancies. Sure, and it's it, it's supply and demand as well. It's if you supply have, and demand. If you have a, if you have a if you're in a market where there's a, a large demand for for space and the tenants not performing and they can't pay their rent, and you can remove that tenant within an efficient manner, and there's someone knocking at the other door, the, the door that can they can come in and produce. Um, you know, I, I think it all goes back to the market. But at the end of the day, 
the landlord tenant relationship is a partnership. Correct. The landlord needs the tenant or a tenant to pay rent to have cash flow. And a tenant needs a landlord to have space. So it's not always, well, how much can I get from this tenant, you know, to, to, right. to juice the lemon and, and, and the tenant, it, it's got to be a working relationship. It's got to be a working partnership and it's got to work for both parties. Cause you want healthy tenants in your center that are making money that are producing so that you can, so that they can pay you rent and ultimately you can have a successful center. Right. Uh, you know, which goes back to a philosophy of win-win versus a philosophy of zero-sum win-lose. Um, and uh, we talked a little bit earlier about co-tenancy. It can have a lot to do with your co-tenancy issues. Uh, you may be up against a co-tenancy percentage requirement, or it may be a tenant uh, that's a named tenant in some of the leases that needs to, to be there. Um, or you benefit from that tenant being there. Um, when you start having vacancies, it can have the unfortunate domino effect. So if the problem isn't, ten isn't if it's not temporary, then you can put the hammer down. Sure. And you need to, you know, go ahead and follow through on, on the default. Um, sometimes you can negotiate with the tenant to avoid the actual eviction. Because the tenant's in trouble, the tenant doesn't necessarily want to spend money on an eviction or go through that process and have that on their record, much like a residential tenant. When you know, uh, so I would always ask the tenant, uh, "Do you want to give up possession?" And I will try to release the space. I'm not going to let you off the hook. You're still liable for the unpaid rent, but we can work together to try to mitigate that. The, in Florida, mitigation of damages is in the law. You're required to do that. There are different approaches. There are different definitions of what it is to mitigate damages. But on, the, on those terms, you save money, time, and brain damage by getting the tenant to agree to voluntarily move out. Um, and you tell the tenant, hey, help me find a tenant to um, relocate into your space. You work to mitigate the damages too. So now you're in a working relationship as opposed to an adversary relationship. Uh, it doesn't always work that way, but you know, and some prefer to go right to court. I prefer to see if you can avoid litigation because I advise all of my clients, litigation is costly and not satisfying at the end of the day, either financially or emotionally. <laughs> sure. Abs no, I, I completely agree. You you don't want to not you do not want to go down that path, and you want to not really go down any legal battle as a, as as that as it relates to that. Let me ask what what ways can you incorporate the reporting of tenant sales into leases? Why why would shopping center owners want this included? And in, just kind of talk about the dynamics of of reporting sales in a lease. Sure. This is actually a good segue from uh, the last topic of tenant defaults because we talk about the relationship between the landlord and the tenant. If you're getting sales reports from a tenant, um, you know that they're having trouble <laughs> or you know that they're doing well. Um, in this day and age, there aren't that many tenants that pay percentage rent. It used to be more common. And if it's a percentage rent provision, of course you have to report sales because that's the basis you're paying rent on. So now... Why, why as a landlord would you want a percentage rent? A percentage rent clause is a inflation hedge, first and foremost, for the landlord. And it's also um, an embodiment of that partnership. If the tenant does well, the landlord benefits. The landlord does well. So back in, in, going back to the regional mall example, in a regional mall, um, a lot of times there was room for expansion. There, you might be able to add another department store or do other things that would improve the foot traffic so that the tenants would, by its nature, make more money. Well, the landlord's incentive to invest in those things was affected by the ability to recoup it with increased rent 
from the existing tenants as opposed to simply waiting for tenants to roll over because again, most of these regional malls, even the inline tenants were pretty long term. So that was a way to make it a win-win, mutually beneficial. If your sales go above a certain break point, and again, it goes back to the percentage of sales for the particular type of retailer that should be paid for rent. So if you go above that norm, the landlord gets a percentage rent. Um, I've, this might be a good point of departure to tell you one of the strangest deals I was involved in, which was a pure percentage rent deal for a Neiman Marcus. Let's hear it. <laughs> um, when I was with the Goodman Company, um, actually just before I started with the Goodman Company in 1999, uh, the principal, Murray Goodman, struck a deal with Neiman Marcus to build a store on Worth Avenue in Palm Beach across from his existing shopping center called the Esplanade, which was anchored by Saks Fifth Avenue and had very high-end tenants. Luxury retail. Luxury retail. Um, but Murray saw the need to have another anchor tenant for the 100 block, the ocean block of Worth Avenue. And Neiman Marcus was interested, but they couldn't come to terms on rent. And they really didn't want to commit to a base rent. So he said, I'll do this as a percentage rent deal. So he took, he, he, he was so confident in that that he took, a, he took a risk in just saying, we'll give you percent. He invested over $20 million to build the store based on a percentage rent deal where his kind of break even where it would make sense was if, if their annual, just kind of coincidentally, if their annual sales were around 20 million or more. Okay. Um, those might not be the exact numbers, but you know, that's that's. And that was at a, kind of that was at a break even threshold? Yeah. More, more or less? That was like the, the rent that he would have done the deal at would be met as, okay. long, as long as they hit that threshold. Understood. Under that, it would kind of be, you know, a loser. He'd be getting below market rent not getting the return on his investment that he was hoping for. Um, his thought was, as I learned, after, when, I, when I got there, the lease was being uh, finished. So I worked on completing the lease. It was pretty much fully negotiated except for construction stuff, the upfit and everything else. But I was amazed. We're doing this 20-year lease with many options, just on percentage rent. Whoa, how can you do that? Well, in the negotiations at one point, that percentage rent was going to convert to a fixed rent with percentage over the fixed rent. Okay, once they met a certain, once they certain met, threshold. But Neiman Marcus balked, and Murray took the plunge. Said, fine, I'll do it. After you're in, maybe someday, we'll negotiate for the base rent. Never happened. He sold that building in about 2012. Um, so the, bu the building, uh, I think they opened about 2001 or 2002. So for all that period, it was just a percentage rent deal. And when he sold that along with the one, the Esplanade, mm -hmm to a fairly institutional investor, O'Connor Partners out of, out of New York, and they underwrote the deal with just that percentage rent lease. And that's my story about percentage rent. It's kind of, uh, to so me, it's, it's would amazing. Would you say that was, a, that was a, a successful deal? It was a very successful deal. He, he got more than, you know, he got a great return on it. Sure. And it did what he wanted it to do, which was solidify the retail on that block. We actually attracted a number of the major retailers from what was called the 200 block of Worth Avenue, like Gucci and Louis Vuitton. Because you because had we did into your incorporated into your development. So it worked as envisioned. It solidified that asset the Esplanade and the Neiman Marcus, and they both sold for a very good cap rate. Sure. 
you, you were involved in a lot of development projects, uh, one of which I believe was up in Wesley Chapel, yes. correct? Yes. Could you kind of walk us through that deal um, and, sure. and how that how that came to fruition and, and just any any um, any cool experiences working on, on that development project? Um, there were a lot of cool experiences. There was also a lot of brain damage. I'm trying to give you. I'm trying to give you the brief. Well, development, version. development is never, never an easy. There's always brain damage in development. That's why developers get compensated so well. Absolutely, and there are always some losers Sometimes. along with the winners, unless you're, unless you know, you have an impeccable track record. Which um, this that, was, that goes back to making sure you underwrite the deal with the with the correct assumptions. Correct, and and in my experience, um, with everybody I've worked for, there have been deals that didn't meet assumptions. Sure. Clearly, it happens, but you want those to be in the minority, and then you're okay. There's got to be nothing worse than doing a deal that you work all you work so hard on it, you you underwrite it, and it, and it doesn't meet the thresholds, and you end up doing it for free or owing money on it. That's why the yes. that's why developers in in today's day and age take such a conservative approach, because so many of them have gotten burnt on the past on doing speculative projects, of which didn't turn out to meet their their minimum thresholds and and it's just it's it's got to be the worst feeling luckily that's never happened to me well fortunately enough it 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 helps counterbalance the desire to overbuild when money is available we tend to overbuild and um when you have a few losers it it helps ring things in because i've been through all different cycles and and the Doing projects for no money or losses is one of those things that you do depending on your projections or your relationships with tenants. Uh, before we go to Wesley Chapel, a little quick aside, back uh, when I was with Zaremba Group uh, in the 90s, we did a lot of Kmarts. Okay. That was our big book of business. And uh, the senior developer who taught me a lot about the business, you know, as an attorney, he was the business guy I worked with, had formerly been with Kmart. Okay. And with others. And that was one of the reasons he had all the relationships with Kmart. And he said, his name was John Sirocco. And early on, he said to me, Larry, you have to understand. I'm out there looking for, you know, Kmart deals and projects. But out of every five we do, there's a good chance that one of them we won't make money on. But we can't walk away from that deal after we presented it to Kmart. We need to do that deal to get the other four. So... You know, that was just like built into his, that some of these we're going to do for practice. We don't want to lose money on them, but we'll, we'll do them for practice because once we get into it, we... Uh, so was that because of the relationship? It was the relationship. It was all about that. And, and that, for a time, worked very well for us, especially because Kmart at that time was diversifying and doing other types of product like Builder Square, which was a Home Depot type thing, Sports Authority, Office Max, and Borders. Those were all subsidiaries of Kmart at one time. Okay. So you could fill out a pretty nice power center with just the Kmart relationship. Yeah. So, but, but that was an aside. Back to Wesley Chapel. The um, genesis of that was um, at the Goodman Company, we were looking for um, opportunities. We had been doing uh, some BJ's anchored shopping centers and some Kohl's anchored shopping centers. And we had a, a DRI that we were working on in Jacksonville and some other larger projects. And uh, we had a, a business guy uh, named John Dowd who had lived in Tampa and who kept his ear to the ground. And um, I believe John was the one that first identified the opportunity with the porters out at Wiregrass Ranch. And at the time, there was a residential developer, Pulte Homes, that was working with the porters to put together the residential deal. And they were looking for a retail developer to pick up some of the costs. And uh, Murray Goodman had a relationship with someone in Pulte Homes. And so it's a lot of relationship stuff uh, behind the scenes. Absolutely. Uh, we, also, is... we also had a local attorney here who was very tight into things. Um, and with that team, we put ourselves in front of the, the Porter family as uh, someone who wanted to be the exclusive retail developer for Wiregrass Ranch. And the deal that was presented to us was Pulte Homes will fund 70% of the DRI the development of regional impact costs, all the upfront things. Because we're talking about a 5,000 acre ranch 
that was going to be converted to multiple uses, long-term project. Uh, they wanted the Goodman Company to fund 30%. So a 70-30 deal, we would be the exclusive retail developer for the entire project. It was a long-term thing. We had a, like a rolling option where we would have to buy a certain amount of land to stay in the deal and do our end of the DRI costs. Uh, in, in phases. In phases. And uh, that started in, in the early 2000s. Um, and by about 2003, we, we had a general commitment from J.C. Penney that they wanted to go there. Um, and they would, here was the big deal. We didn't know if we could put together what became the shops of Wiregrass with Penny, Macy's, Dillard's, uh, Barnes and Noble and all that stuff. But um, we were able to do a development with, before the DRI approvals, development regional impact, with up to 400,000 square feet. So we looked at the opportunities and at the corner of Brisby Downs and State Road 56, um, if you extended State Road 56, it would be a nice entry to uh, Wiregrass Ranch, the Porter's property, and they wanted a nice retail project there. Uh, so we could put J.C. Penney and a couple of out parcels as a first phase, and then up on State Road 54, uh, the Porters were already working a deal with Walmart. Walmart was interested in property up there. So we were able to take over that potential deal if we would buy the land to do the Walmart and some out parcels. And between those two out parcels, about 200,000 square feet on one and about 200,000 square feet on the other, we were able to do what would be our first phase, our first takedown of land, with the option to take down the rest to do the shops at Wiregrass, and then any other things that came up. Um, uh, in about 2006, J.C. Penney broke, uh, actually had a grand opening. So from early 2000s to that point in time, we're working on the DRI. You're telling me it took six years? Yes. That's, some of these big projects take longer than that. I'm being a little sarcastic, but no, development it's a good, is a, it's a long, good observation. long pro process. Yeah, it took, I mean, it took a few years for us to make a deal with the porters because the porters were very conservative and concerned about what was going to happen. Uh, they didn't want their legacy to be junked up. And they had a blank canvas, so they wanted it to be done canvas. with the right, they wanted the right partners from what it sounds like, yes. the right team to come in and, and they, they participate in the retail component. And they picked the team. Um, by the time we got involved, uh, Pulte and the Porters had already agreed on um, a land use attorney the engineering firm, and you know several other things. So they already had uh, some conceptual site plans and things of that nature, which went through very various evolutions. Um, so it took us a few years to actually get to contract with them, and then it took us a few years to get to the J.C. Penney lease. It took us about a, a, about two years, I think, to get J.C. Penney to get approval at committee, and then a full year of negotiating the actual ground lease with J.C. Penney and the REA, the reciprocal easement agreement that was going to govern whatever else we put attached to J.C. Penney because we wanted to keep the option. We wanted to do a lifestyle center, but we weren't sure we could do that. So we had the ability to do some other types of in the second phase. Um, and then as we were doing the J.C. Penney deal, we realized that we needed some more firepower to get the entire deal done, so we brought in a joint venture partner, Forest City, out of Cleveland. Um, Forest City at the time was doing similar projects, one in California, one in Virginia, a couple of others, where they were putting together the same type of lifestyle center uh, project, so they had all the contacts with those tenants. Um, we had some contacts, but we needed the, the firepower. It was a great choice because um, the shit hit the fan around that time. Between 2006 and 2008, when we were committed with J.C. Penney to get two more anchors in order for them to have an operating covenant, which is important when you're putting together a deal like that. It's like a regional mall. In a regional mall, the, the department stores are key and you need them to agree they're going to stay open for a certain minimum period of time. 
J.C. Penney said, if we're freestanding, we're not going to agree to stay and operate and close whenever. We can sublease to somebody else. We can do whatever we want. Uh, but if you get the other two anchors to open by October 2008, we'll have a 10-year operating agreement that springs up, springing 10-year, okay. to run concurrently with 10-year operating agreements that you get from those other two tenants. So that was the, those were the marching orders. And that was the trigger. That was the trigger. Uh, either that succeeded or hard to say what would be there. So it was a full court press uh, to get the other tenants to commit. Construction started before we even um, got the DRI approvals. Um, we wouldn't have been able to actually complete the project without the DRI approvals, but they started doing site work and, and even structural steel and the extension of State Road 56, which was part of the deal. In this time, things were going quite poorly in the real estate market, and Pulte Homes pulled out. This is 2006? This is 2006, 2007. Um, so we were alone with the Porter family without what was really the main driver, which was the rooftops. Sure. The oh, reason our retailers were going there was because we had this projection of, over a long period of time, 16,000 homes. The first phase that Pulte committed to, almost committed to, <laughs> was 2,000 homes. That never happened. So we continued. Our tenants got antsy, but we held them together. And uh, you know, a lot of them coming up on uh, in 2008, before the 2008 grand opening, a lot of the small shops and everybody wanted to get out of their leases. But Forest City, Forest City really was able to hold them together and say, no, this is going to happen. So in October of 2008, grand opening, um, the tenancy level wasn't where we would want it to be, but it was good enough to have the critical mass there. And um, it's become a very successful project. At a certain point in time, uh, Forest City bought us out so that they could put that project into a pool of assets with an Australian company, QIC, which has since bought Forest City out. Okay. So the, the, that's, you know, the, there was a lot of brain damage. There was actually, in connection with the um, DRI approvals, there were problems with transportation impact fees. There were lawsuits back and forth, which we all, you know, settled. Uh, we at one point had to sue Walmart because they weren't proceeding with the project. And our out parcels that we owned there had no value without the uh, Walmart. And, but we all got through it. <laughs> you know, I wasn't involved in this project, obviously, but just listening to you talk about it is an amazing story, you know, and it seems like a long process. I mean, I think I'm growing some gray hair over here. You know what I mean? It, you know, it's 10 years in the making. Well, I and- lost a lot of hair. <laughs> well, you know, we, we all probably will at some point. Um, yeah, but it was, you know, I'm very proud to have been part of that project. And um, J.D. Porter, who is the representative of the Porter family at this point in time, um, acknowledges that you know there were some tough times but we all pulled together and uh, did what had to be done to get it done and it has helped as a springboard for what is still happening in Wiregrass Ranch. There's still a lot of great development to happen and they're being selective and, and they're doing still doing some great things out there. Super cool story. Thanks so much for sharing on that. I mean that's there, there's nothing like, and the fact that it was a success as well, you know, there's never, there's nothing like going through a project like that and, and sitting at the end of the day and, and seeing it operating and be successful and thriving in a community. I mean, that's why we love commercial real estate. That's why I love commercial real estate is to be able to, to look at a project at the end of the day and see how it impacts local communities. And, and so, so that's, so that's really awesome. Um, what, what, you know, I, I, we live in Florida in Florida, we have a lot of hurricanes or threats from hurricanes. You know, I want to talk a little bit with you about this term force majeure. It's, it's, I think it's a French term, or sounds French at least. And, and you know, what, what is it? Have you ever run into that with any of your clients? You know, tell us about some of your experience, experiences with uh, force majeure. Well, thankfully, it's fairly limited. Um, the experience I have does kind of have to do with hurricanes, but... Um, the only force majeure issues that I've really experienced that, that I can recall, we always negotiated into the lease. 
And you always say, give examples of what it's going to be. Act of God, weather, yeah. uh, riots, you know, insurrection, all kinds of, th- those things are usually explaining what force majeure can mean. It, it literally means a major force. So force majeure is a major force. Beyond okay. your control. And in negotiating, we get into, like, around the edges, what's in your control, what's not in your control. A lot of times we put in language that says inability to get financing, not force majeure. All right. Even, you know, when interest rates go to shit or whatever. And it's important that that's specifically detailed out. Yes. Um, But the the actual events that I've had experience with are construction delays uh, due to materials or weather and hurricane damage to shopping centers, um, which you know I've experienced a few. Uh, when I was in South Florida uh, with the Goodman Company, we had a couple of hurricanes that actually affected our shopping centers there. And those, thankfully, the issues were worked out with insurance or common sense, never litigation. So if, if the shopping center couldn't be opened for a certain period of time, everybody kind of licked their wounds, looked to their insurers, figured out how to regroup, and you know we, we didn't have any um, complete destruction of anything. So that's my experience. It's, it's a very important clause, but it's good, at least for me, that in my career, it really hasn't uh, been triggered that often. And, and I have never, we, we haven't really dealt with the issue all that much. Uh, I know this past year with Hurricane Irma coming up through the west coast of Florida and impacting certain areas along the west coast more so than others, we had developer clients that um, had tenants that d- it delayed the construction process and they're you know currently discussing and potentially the, the you know, the tenant is trying to get out of their lease, lease obligation for new construction. Right. Um, so it... And that's subjective, right? I mean, that you kind of have to go to the court and say, hey, listen, you know, force majeure. We had, you know, a hurricane come through and, and it delayed our construction timeline by two weeks. And, I, you know, ultimately, I think it's just really, if the tenant wanted to be there, the tenant would have continued to go down the path to operate the space and, and build out. But I think the fact is that the tenant ultimately didn't want to do the deal, but they were signed up for it and it gave them a reason to discuss not wanting to proceed forward. I think you're exactly right. And that's, that's why I say a lot of the things, or, or not a lot, but the few things that I've had to deal with were resolved with common sense. Sure. And, and that's, you know, the common sense. If, if you've got a month delay, well, maybe they get a month of free rent um, if they're not made whole by insurance. But they don't get to terminate the lease. Yep. No, it's, a, it's important. I think, it, you know, act of God, you know, over here we have hurricanes for the most part that's the big act of God that could potentially occur. But, you know, you in California, you have earthquakes. Yes. And in other parts of the of the U.S., you have different items that, you know, tornadoes in, in, the, in, the, in the Midwest and things of that nature. So uh, I think it's definitely important to include into the lease obligation, have an understanding, and as you mentioned, detail out specifically what potentially could occur and what would be the uh, the remedies to either either rectify how we would move forward or discuss you know, what the process would be in protocols. Um, as a kind of an afterthought or, or maybe as an add-on comment, we started adding acts of terrorism to force majeure after 9-11 uh-huh. because we weren't sure whether or not that was included in the force majeure general description of riots. So now we typically add that to be sure that it's understood and thankfully we haven't had i certainly haven't had anything but uh that's that's one of those things that was a specter initially with all all regional malls were concerned about terrorist attacks and uh that um terrorism insurance unfolded because of that and everything else but a lot of the things that are force majeure are still covered by insurance but not all Gotcha. Yeah, I, I want to touch on on estoppel letters. You know, what are they, and how are, and, and why are they so important to the buyer and their bank? But before I get into the question, I just wanted to uh, on the estoppel side. 
we um we worked with a client that was selling a strip center. Typically, in a lot of these, um, well, go ahead. What what is an estoppel certificate or estoppel letter first and foremost? Well, the, the basic thing is a estoppel letter or a certificate. It's it's a means to get the tenant or other parties to an agreement, like a reciprocal easement agreement, to confirm the current status of the lease or the agreement. Um, in its simplest form for a tenant, it says this is the lease. They identify the lease. Sometimes the copy of the lease is attached. Uh, this is the rent. I paid rent through such and such. Landlord's not in default under any of its obligations. Uh, I've accepted possession, you know, some of those things. And the value of it is, is when the tenant confirms that there's no default or no outstanding lurking issues um, and that the rent is the rent, we don't have any side deals, the buyer and the lender can later rely on that. And the tenant can't claim otherwise. That's where the word estoppel comes from. They're estopped, great word, great right. legal term. They're estopped from claiming otherwise. Um, now, interesting thing, it doesn't necessarily change the lease. If a tenant confirms the rent as something other than what is in the lease, the lease still, as between the landlord and the tenant, Prevails. is the agreement. But the tenant can't claim otherwise to the people relying on the estoppel, the buyer and the lender. We, we, had, an, we had an example where I was selling a uh, shopping center uh, here in the Tampa market, and the shopping center was occupied by a convenience. Um, one of the major tenants was a convenience store, more or less. And we were under contract to sell the, to sell the center, uh, and the buyer requested an estoppel to be signed by the the tenants, obviously, which is pretty standard, you know, pretty standard in a transaction uh, such as that. Uh, sent over uh, the estoppel to the tenant, he was reluctant to sign the agreement because it was different. It was it differed from what him, from what the tenant and the current landlord understanding of the lease agreement was. Now there were some. There was a lease. There was amendments to a lease. There were emails that were communicated between the landlord and the tenant. They could have been potentially looked at as amending to the lease. So there was a, there was a, it, it, it ultimately ended up getting to a point where the convenience store client was not in agreement with what the landlord was claiming the lease to be of which the landlord was then selling the property with that lease in place to the new buyer. So it, when you talk about side agreements and getting buy off on tenants as it relates to their obligations and understanding of, of the leases is super, super important. And that was a that was an experience that, I, that I'll never forget. It was a very challenging experience, but ultimately we were able to come to terms and get, get the deal done by everyone using common sense. Perfect example of flushing out what the tenant's understanding is and whether it varies from what the landlord's understanding is. And there are a number of ways to, to work that out. Uh, one of the things uh, that I've seen when the tenant simply won't sign the estoppel, even though the lease says they have to for whatever reason, um, or if they send a estoppel that varies from what the understanding is, the seller can give an affidavit or whatever. But ultimately, it's an underwriting decision. If the tenant thinks that their rent should be less than it is, or if the tenant thinks they have some offset, well, you want the seller to eat that. <laughs> you, you, you want to underwrite at the, at the lower rent in of case course. that's all you're right. able to get. Um, it, preferably, you get it resolved before the, before the closing. But I've seen circumstances where if it can't get resolved and it's a big transaction and this tenant isn't essential to it, you can come at it from a couple of, of different ways, but it's an underwriting issue. You, you want everyone to be on the same page, especially as a buyer. You want, you want the, all the tenants to give. You, don't, you could purchase the center without the estoppel, I mean, without banking considerations and things of that nature. You don't necessarily have to have a sign estoppel to, to purchase the property. Correct. But you you, you want to get that confirmation that that the tenant's on board with their obligation. Um, you know, that would be the proper way to do it, but it doesn't prohibit a sale of the property. Right. It, it's, you know, what you can do to satisfy the buyer. Um, same thing with the lender. In fact, when you do the sale of a property, um, typically you don't want to agree 
that you're going to get 100% estoppels. You try to negotiate so that there's only a certain critical mass of estoppels that you have to get in order for the deal to go forward. Um, and that may include estoppels for specific name tenants that you can't close without, and then a certain percentage of the unnamed tenants with the landlord making representations and warranties. Um, actually, what you do is a landlord or seller estoppel. So it's, it's like the tenant certificate says the same thing, but the landlord signs it, and then the and landlord's it. exposed sure. for that. Um, but to go back to the, the fundamental aspect, no retail lease should be signed without the requirement that the tenant provide an estoppel. And it's sometimes missed. And what and what and it's super important to include that in there. What do you what do you see as as time frames? And if and if a tenant does not sign an estoppel within a certain period of time, it can technically, if you include it in the lease agreement, be a default of the lease. Correct. And there's two sides to that. Um, we, we try to put language in that says if the tenant doesn't respond to the estoppel within a certain number of days, then the landlord, as the attorney, in fact, for the tenant can sign the estoppel. It's a default, it's a, it's, a, it's a leap, nobody wants to do that necessarily, but it allows you to send to the buyer or to the lender an estoppel that's a little hybrid of, of the landlord estoppel that I was talking about. So it's a tenant estoppel, but it's signed by the landlord under the power of attorney that's in the lease. Understood. Um, national tenants won't agree to that. Uh, so it's it's a negotiation point and it's not the greatest resolution. Awesome. Well, Larry, thank you so much for coming here and, and talking with us today. We really enjoyed it. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure seeing you and thank you so much for your time. Well, thanks for having me.